there's such a strong calling for me to do this that I'm just going to surrender and go, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea how this is all going to come together. I had full confidence that I could learn as I go. And I surrounded myself with people that I felt had enough experience that they could hold my hand through the process. You just have to allow people to have their journey and hold space with love, not impose your beliefs on them. People that don't necessarily resonate with the same things you do, how do you converse with them? That was terrifying and so intriguing to me because I'm like, whoa, I feel like I'm the pillar of help. I'm very aware, but she's an example that I could wake up with something growing beneath the surface. I wanted to find out more. When I'm talking to people on this podcast about their journey, a lot of times something really bad happens in order to kind of pivot, cause them to pivot away from um, seeking that conventional idea of success into following their heart, taking leaps of faith and, and finding their purpose and all of that. And so, yeah, that's one way to do it. But then another way is some people are just really curious. You know, they have some experiences. It opens up some unlocked curiosity within and they just keep following that. And that was actually my experience. Like I never, I had a great family life, a great, great upbringing. It wasn't perfect, obviously, but I, when I came across a few books that um, gave me language for all the things that I was feeling, coming from a very Christian background and, and kind of now opening my eyes to the spiritual realm. I was so excited. I just could not get enough of it. I was at the Bodhi Tree bookstore on Melrose all the time. I was at Agape all the time. I was, you know, we met in yoga class. And so, um, so then I guess that was your experience as well, right? You didn't come from some deep, dark, you know, rock bottom, dark night of the soul moment. No, exactly. And thank, you know, thankfully so, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but totally curiosity and this is like combination between this just knowing that sparked, you know, I want to know more. You know, this this resonates so deeply. Like, resonate is such a spiritual community word <laughs> that uh people say, but it's like it's there's no other way to describe it. It's just like this knowing that what you're reading feels so truthful to you. And it doesn't matter if it feels truthful to anybody else. It, it feels truthful to you. And then it compels you to start doing things that in, continue to improve your, your physical experience, you know? Yeah. And the other thing you learn is that not everybody resonates with that. Because obviously you're excited. You're talking about it a lot. You're making references to these things, manifesting and affirming and all of that. And, you, you know, people start rolling their eyes. I'm sure when you talk to Marty about it, he probably, he's probably happy for you as his daughter, but he probably didn't really buy into it. I'm imagining, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, how did you finally kind of, how did you come to terms with, with, you know, who, who the safest places that you could talk about it, or did you just not care? Yeah. Again, in my hypervigilance, I would determine if someone was open to talking about it and I would talk about it with them. And for me, who doesn't like confrontation and, and drama. I avoided talking about it with people that I just didn't, you know, I, you kind of just know who, it, and, and the, interestingly around that same time, like I started paying attention and I think I learned this from Reverend Michael, but I started getting, I would have a conversation with you or anybody else. And I'd be talking about these things and I would just light up and I would feel this like surge of energy in my body. And he's like, follow that follow what makes you excited to talk about. It. And I could talk about these concepts of quantum physics and energy and manifestation and subconscious mind. And, you know, what happens after death and all this, these things I would just want to talk about for hours and then juxtapose that to like, you know, i I booked a film and was carrying the film, which is like what I was, a, had been striving for my whole life. And Every day I would wake up, I would be drained. I didn't want to sit in the makeup chair two to two hours every morning. I didn't like, I would, you know, memorizing my lines. It was very stressful for me because I had this pressure on myself that I have to do it right. And I was like, this is not, <laughs> Meryl Streep doesn't have this stress, which is why she's amazing. I'm, I don't know that I should be an actor because I'm way too in my head and self-conscious and beating myself up all the time. So 
I just had this awareness, like I need to follow what gives me energy and, and let go of something that is no longer feeding me that curiosity and passion. And uh, were you forging relationships with these people who you admired, uh, like, like the Beckwiths, like the Liptons um, and others who were in that uh, more metaphysical field at that time? No, I, until I started actually like pursuing the beginning of making heal, I, you know, had put on a pedestal, all of these people and didn't feel Mm -hmm. worthy of having conversations. I was very shy in that way. Um, Mm -hmm. my whole life, this was like that weird push pull of this whole acting thing. Like I love to be the star of the commercial and acting on that, but I was just connecting to humans outside of that and making new relationships. I was always very shy. That, that didn't come easy for me. I was uncomfortable um, starting these conversations and meeting new people. So um, yeah, I, I would like take a class from Michael, but I wouldn't connect with him after or feel, uh, you know, worthy of, of asking him a question, you know, which is just so interesting to think about. So when you decided to finally put this deck for your um, your documentary together, what happened just before that? Why that time as opposed to, you said you've been germinating on the site for 10 years. So why that time in your life did you decide now is the time to finally take the first step? Yeah, so um, I had gone so far as to hire my friend as a producer because I was getting, I knew I was getting closer And I started, I said, if, you know, if I don't hire someone and start paying them kind of like what you did with finishing your book, the deadline, Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) that I would just maybe be scared because of the shyness I have and this fear, fear of failure. I, I keep kicking this can down the road. So I hired her for about a year and and we would meet and we would do research together. Um, ironically, all the research that she did, it was like, didn't end up pushing the film forward. It was just, it was just holding me accountable. (laughs) You know, it was like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so the real last straw that got me to this place where I just knew I was ready. And I knew that I had to make this film was reading Anita Morjani's story, dying to be me. And, um, I really wanted Wayne Dyer in my film. Mm -hmm. So I, I was listening to something he was doing and he mentioned this Anita Morjani, woman. And so, um, I read her book and I was like, her story to me is so fascinating. And it's, she's the poster child of heel. I mean, her, she basically to, to keep it short, she, um, had stage four cancer, lymphoma, and she had lemon sized tumors from her neck all the way down to her abdomen coming out of her skin. She had done Western medicine. She had done Eastern medicine. She was a Hindu woman that was raised in Hong Kong. So she was in both of these worlds. Um, she tried everything. She had lost her best friend to cancer and she was in a, she went into a coma. Her organs were shutting down her body. There's no way that any human would look at this physical body and say it could recover. It was just so far gone in that coma. She had a near death experience. She went into the other realm and experienced this, like that magnanimous love that many people describe on, on the other side and um, has had this, and she said, you know, time was no longer linear. Everything was happening at once. And she encountered the essence of her father who in life, they had a very tumultuous relationship because he was very strict Hindu and she had been Westernized in Hong Kong. And she kind of went away from the religion, didn't have the arranged marriage and, and really disappointed her father. And in that moment of, of being with his essence and communicating telepathically or just in a knowing, um, there was no judgment. There was just pure, unconditional, this, this love that she couldn't describe. And in that moment, in their conversation and exchange of, of information, she realized that everything, every decision she had made in her life was driven by fear. And that's why she ended up with the cancer. And her dad basically said, you, you should go back to your body. Um, you're not done with your work on earth. And she's like, I want to stay here. This feels fantastic. <laughs> But in that moment, she knew if she went back to her body, she would heal with this new knowing that fear 
it's that fear love thing. And, and, and now she no longer had to fear death because she knows that we just go back to where we came from, you know, pure love. And, and there's still the essence of who we are, whatever. So she had this shift in consciousness, came back into her body, recounted things that she would not possibly have been able to know in her coma that shocked the doctors. And within weeks, there was no more cancer in her body. And she goes around the world talking about it now. So I read that story and I was like, okay, that's it. I'm ready to do it. And uh, that was kind of the, the last straw, but it was just this knowing I was finally, I'm ready. Let's do this. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out. And back to the show. Was there, um, I'm not as familiar with her story, but is there a, what, was it just the awareness that life continues on beyond body death that, that she credited with healing her, her body or what did she do something different when she came back out of the coma? Yeah. I think that experience of deep connection and oneness she didn't have a body on the other side. She was so connected to her father's essence and it was only love. There was no judgment. So she said it was just this clarity that, you know, we forget that when we're in these bodies and seemingly separate, but we are all connected. We are all one. We are, we're made from this divine love and that's where we're going back to. So, so basic human ego fears just dissolved. they no longer existed because this experience she had was so powerful. And mm -hmm. so it caused this like just permanent shift in her perception of life. And there was nothing else to fear. And I, I asked her when I interviewed her, I said, do you ever fear anything? Like, is there anything you ever fear now? Like, do you fall back into the old ways? And she says, maybe momentarily, you know, but then I can, I can, I have the awareness now to go, oh, that's just, that's not me. That's my ego. Or that's, an old pattern or the energy in the room or whatever, you know? Um, so my, I'm like, how can we all get that shift in consciousness without having to have a near death experience, you know? All right. So you're going to do a film. Does it have a title yet? Is it called healed at heal at this point when you put it together in the deck or is it just like documentary about people who get better? <laughs> <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, if I recall correctly, I think we came up with the name heal before I, I'm picturing it on the deck. You know, I think that it had an actual title as I was sending it out to people. Okay. So you got to find people who are going through a healing journey or who have gone through a healing journey. You also have to find experts to talk about this. And, you know, now we've had what the bleep we've had the secret, we've had other documentaries. So I'm imagining people like Deepak Chopra and Bruce Lipton, they are probably getting hit up thousand times a day for everybody and their mother wants to do a documentary and have them come in, give commentary. So what was the plan to, to get these people's attention? <laughs> exactly. And find um, these, these people who are going through these healing journey. Totally. Um, you know, I had the awareness. I was just like this, there's such a strong calling for me to do this, that I'm just going to surrender and go, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea how this is all going to come together, but you know, I'd been to agape enough times where, you know, Michael's just like, get out of the way, let God, let go and let God. So I um, really had that kind of understanding that it was just, it was unfolding and it was going to unfold. And I just had to keep one step foot in front of the other. Um, and so I started by going to a celebrate your life conference because a bunch of these people, a bunch of these teachers that were in the secret and um, books that I read, you know, it was like Bruce Lipton, Greg Braden, Darren Weissman, uh, Joe Dispenza, Marianne Williamson, Sue Mortar, Joan Borisenko, all of these people that I wanted in the film were at this conference, you know, so. How did you I find went, out about the conference? I don't know. I don't know how I found out. Like, were you looking for a conference where everyone's going to be in one place at one time? I think it was part of that whole period in my life. I was just like, so hungry to, I was in it, you know, I wanted yeah. to, 
I wanted to know more now that I gotten a taste and I I'll tell you, cause you asked before, um, after I watched the secret, one of the things that I really implemented in my life was gratitude journaling. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it was Bob Proctor in the film, but he was all about writing down. Cause I've, I've been journaling since I was little, like writing as a medium of mine for just creative expression or whatever. And so he would say, write what you're grateful for as if you already had them or as if they had already happened. So I just every day wrote in my journal, I'm so happy and grateful now that that was his directive. And so I started doing this and it was basically about qualities that I wanted that I'm, you know, obviously financially free, that I can see a masseuse once a week, like just different qualities of life that I wanted. And he said, don't worry about the how, the how is going to trip you up. Just focus on what you want and feel the feelings of already having them. So I do that every day. And uh, literally three months later, I was still waiting tables three times a week. And three within three months, I booked this job that I didn't even know existed. Uh, it was a fit model for guest jeans. And I went from like going paycheck to paycheck to working like, you know, a few hours a week every day, like four days a week, four hours a day and making over a hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, oh my God, the secret really works, you know? <laughs> so that, you know, that, that hooked me. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I still gratitude journal to this day and, you know, meditation I is my lifeblood. But um, so I started to do gratitude work around it, but then I found this, this I was just so into these talks um, at celebrate your life conference. And, and I just got so inspired and heal was coming together in my mind, but I would have to connect with these people, which was, I was so like my, my heart was racing and they would have these book signings after their talks. And I had brought my producer friend, Rochelle with me and she was, she was great. You know, she, she like really encouraged me and gave me confidence to connect with these people, but I was so uncomfortable. So I'd wait in line to have them sign my book. And then I'd be like, turn bright red and be like, I'm doing this film. And, 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 you know, um, they'd give me their card and then I would follow up and, you know, they all, a lot of them said, yes, Andrew Weil said, no, Dr. Josh, uh, ax said, no, those are two people, uh, that I pursued said no, but, um, most people said yes. And then I, I randomly had this connection to Deepak Chopra, um, and I met with him and he said, explain to me what you're doing. And, and he said, great, I'll do it. And then all, you, all you need is like one, right. And then you yeah. can be like Deepak Chopra is doing it. Correct. And so-and-so is doing it. And everyone else is like, okay, well, if Deepak's doing it. then. so when you're at this conference, do you have the deck in your back pocket? I know you have a wonderful smile and presence and all of that, but did you have, <laughs> do you have anything more than that? Or were you literally just pitching them? within 20 seconds of, you know, cause I'm sure there's a whole line of people behind you wanting to get their book signed and they yeah. probably have a handler saying, come on, keep it going, keep it going. And then you're there trying to pitch your little idea. So <laughs> exactly. what did you, what did you have to, to say or leave to them? What was your pitch? Yeah. You know, we were in the digital age. So I, I just, I gave them like a, a 20 second pitch. Cause I knew I'm very, again, hypervigilant. I don't want to piss anyone off in line. I don't want to get in trouble by the handler. So I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. and, uh, and then, you know, they would say, oh, that sounds interesting. You know, here, take my assistant's card or here's my card or whatever. And then I just followed up with a short, brief cover letter and, uh, and the deck. And then of course, when Deepak said, yes, I was like, and Deepak Chopra is involved. <laughs> <laughs> so that made it like flow a lot better, you know? Was there a budget at this point? Um, how developed was the project beyond just having a deck and a, and a friend of yours who was going to be the producer? That was it. Um... <laughs> you, never, <laughs> you didn't have a start date? You didn't have anything, <laughs> any other information to give to them? No, I, I said it was financed because, you know, my husband graciously, you know, assured me that we would be able to do this. And, um, and so that was, you know, they just want to know that it's financed. That's, that's the harder part, hardest part of of filmmaking, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, nobody really asks the budget or sees, I think at that point, all of those people, um, what I found is that they just go with their, 
their intuition and their gut, you know, they're, they're pretty well connected and they're, so they feel into it, you know, they liked my energy and they, then they saw as more people were signing on and, and it's kind of a small community. And it's like Bruce, Greg, Joe, they all know each other. So it's like, if they all decide to do it or they all talk about it and feel good about it, it's like, let's do it, you know? So it's cool that way. Is there, um, just logistically, is there an exchange, like, do you have to pay people to be in a documentary like that? Or what do they get out of it? Great question. Documentaries, I don't think legally you can pay someone to appear in them because they're supposed to be, I mean, perhaps you can, uh, but the spirit of a documentary is that it's supposed to be not incentivized or subjectified in any way. You're just supposed to get to the, the you know, the facts, Ruth. Um, so we didn't pay anybody. They just all volunteered their time. And like I said, they're at this point in their life where they just want to share their teachings. And they hope that a few of them were concerned. Actually, only one person was concerned and she was a scientist and a researcher. And she, um, either had been in a film before and they took her out of context and presented her in a way that she was very affronted by. And so she was terrified that that was going to happen again. So we had a lot of legal contracts around that, um, making sure I didn't, you know, she gets final approval over her interview and everything like that, but everybody else just kind of trusted. And what about the fact that you've never shot a documentary before? <laughs> Again, <laughs> you should ask these were you, people. No. <laughs> were you, were you reading, were you reading docu documentary making for dummies at night, while you're <laughs> reaching out to these people during the day? Totally. You do. You have to fake it till you make it. But I, I had been on sets my whole life, and like I said in the in the TP play pretend game of Lost, I would I kind of naturally liked that role of director. So um, I was I was nervous about the technical side of things. I was trying to educate myself on the technical direction because, you know, I wanted to see when like I knew what I was doing when I have these uh, big names on my set, but you know as far as the creative directing, I had full confidence that I could learn as I go. And I surrounded myself with people that I felt had enough experience that they could hold my hand through the process. Hmm. Okay. So let's cut to day one. What was that like for you? Ooh, sweaty. Um, I was, <laughs> I was nervous. Um, and it was so funny because I'm, I'm all about nature and I, I just envisioned this beautiful documentary that was going to be kind of a healing experience as you watched it. So it's going to be these beautiful scenes and the interviews will be outdoors and you'd see these, you know, elements of nature within the interviews. Um, and so we shot Darren Weissman was our first interview and we were shooting with three cameras, three angles. And it was just like, you know outside so the, the we had to stop when the wind came we had to stop there's helicopters that like fly over my house for tourism it's like it was a disaster but um Darren was so gracious and we ended up reshooting his interview uh because there were so many hiccups and it was kind of the training wheels day I learned so much um what not to do going forward that we went back and shot his interview months later because he was kind enough to do so yeah I was wondering um was that just a fluke or was that like, if someone was an experienced documentary filmmaker, would they have known all those little things that, that got you kind of tripped up on that first day? Like, don't shoot outside. Don't, you know, whatever. Don't start at this time. Yeah. And they would have been more prepared and had, uh, you know, not play around with cameras and what you wanted on the day of the talent showing up, you would have actually rehearsed and figured out your shots uh, beforehand in a professional manner, but for whatever the reason, my whole life, I've been a procrastinator. I work well under pressure. Um, so that's just the way that I've functioned. And now in hindsight, like, yeah, I should have been way more methodical in my preparation. <laughs> so that's, you know, sometimes it's a benefit. I can, I have the, I, I used to just cram for tests the night before and ACE them, um, and not retain any of the knowledge, you know? Uh, so yeah, in hindsight, I think it was just my lack of preparation and, and planning. Okay, and then where do you find people going through healing journeys? So I know you, you, you've you mentioned that you didn't just want people who had already healed. You actually wanted people 
who were going through it in real time, which is, I guess, much riskier as a documentary filmmaker because you don't know what the timeline is going to be, right? Where do you find those people and what were some of the challenges of documenting their, their journey? Great question. Um, I had this lofty idea that like, you know, I'm going to start and finish this documentary in one year's time because there was just certain circumstances in my life that like I had like a short window to complete this thing, which is so funny because you don't, when you're doing a documentary, you don't know, especially following real people on healing journeys, you have no idea the timeline and the length of time it's going to take to watch this all unfold. Most documentaries are shot over a span of five to seven years, you know? So, um, or a lot of them, I don't know if most is accurate, but um, so, and I had this idea, I wanted to do, find a veteran with PTSD and see how meditation could help them and perhaps psychedelics. Um, and I really just wanted to highlight that community because, you know, so many are in need of healing. And the veteran thing just was so hard to connect to. It's so interesting. Like I just, they're everywhere. There's so many, especially even in Los Angeles, like just right down on San Vicente Boulevard in Brentwood. Um, but at the time I just, we just didn't align with the right story or the right person for, cause it wasn't obviously meant to be. Um, but in the journey, like we found different people in that search for the veteran. Ironically, while I was searching for the veteran, my um, friends who works at my husband's office and is the notary public came to our house to have us sign some documents for a property or a, something that we both had to sign. And she handed over the papers and I noticed on her hand, I didn't even barely notice, but she was like, oh, I'm so sorry about my rashes. I'm just had this thing. And again, me being the shy, not really easy to connect person, um, I would never normally pry and ask further about that. I'd be like, oh my God, don't even worry about it. And then I'd sign the papers and move on. Well, I had this, you know, nudge to be curious and ask more. And so I asked her what's, you know, what's going on. And so she told me about this whole mystery illness and, um, she ended up being in the film because I was like, wow, this is like fascinating. And also I really want to help you. Do you mind this, you know, I'm making this documentary. Um, I, I know a lot of people in different modalities. Do you mind if I just document us trying to get to the bottom of, of your illness that you, it's been a mystery for five years that you've been dealing with. And she's like, okay. You know, she thought about it and she said, yeah, let's do it. So she was really courageous in letting me follow her. Um, Cause she was very private too. And then the other one uh, is Elizabeth because there's been other documentaries done about healing and, and this sort of thing, but they were all just talking heads, interviews, speaking in hindsight about their illness. And I wanted to see the real, feel the feelings that you go through because intellectually, everything I talk about in the film makes sense, but you put on the fear and the stress and finances and, you know, the fear of a diagnosis, like you can't quite capture that unless you're experiencing that with, with the person. So I wanted to be conscious of that. And so, um, we aligned with this woman who was the spiritual, spiritual psychologist who had worked with a woman with stage four cancer and had documented the whole thing and wanted to make a documentary about it. And so essentially we just hooked up with her and licensed her footage because she had already completed a lot of what I was looking for. Um, so that one year process that I had this lofty goal of achieving just was made possible through the fact that we aligned with two people willing to be a part of our project. And I just licensed a lot of her footage that she already had. Did you have a certain number of cases in mind that you thought would make for a proper documentary? Like I need to have 10 people going through a healing journey. And if so, um, was it difficult to find that many people? Because like you say, uh, if you're going through it, it's not usually something you want to announce to the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm from battling with X, Y, and Z. So how, how did that all play out? Yeah, I had, you know, the Trinity, the trifecta number in my head. I, I thought three was enough to where we could go deep 
uh, but would give us enough variety. Um, and again, I was thinking cancer because it's so rampant uh, today. Uh, I was thinking a veteran with PTSD and mental health issues. Uh, and then I was thinking of a child with, you know, perhaps autism or, or something else. Um, and so we ended up finding this, this child with autism uh, whose mom really helped him heal um, through diet and food. And so that was really cool. And we filmed his story and his story is still in progress. Uh, but we ended up in like at the end of the filming process, it was just too much. It ended up being actually too much to even follow three stories. So mm. it, so we ended up not using the, the kid's story in the film. Um, that was a choice we made. We did a, we made it into a short film that we gave to the mom later to use as, as she wanted, but, um, and her story was very much about physical nutrition, um, which is interesting. But when we looked at the scope of the footage we had in the interviews and what was coming forward most powerfully was all about like belief systems and forgiveness and the, the spiritual, emotional aspects of it. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, that being the premise, like, okay, your belief system impacts or influences how your body responds to um, the environment. Was it hard to maintain integrity around that? Because you don't know what's what these people's, you know, healing journey is going to encompass. And obviously, you want to you want to show things that are going to support your hypothesis that yes, your belief is huge when it comes to this, but, you know, how challenging was that to, like, did you find yourself maybe suggesting to some of these people that, well, you know, try making affirmations or, you know, things like that. So you could film it and, and it could support what you guys were talking about in the, in the, in the commentary. What are you suggesting? No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was definitely trying to be very sensitive to everybody's process and also be aware of my judgments and wishes and desires that I may perhaps be imposing on someone else. Um, what I thought was so interesting about the woman with cancer who we followed, you know, I thought her story was very compelling because she quote unquote, did everything right. And she kind of looks like me. She's like a thin, tall blonde who did yoga, studied acupuncture, did green juices. Like she's very much LA yoga community. Um, and yet she woke up one day with stage four anal cancer. So um, that was terrifying and so intriguing to me because I'm like, whoa, I'm, I feel like I'm the pillar of help. I'm very aware, but she's an example that I could wake up with something growing beneath the surface, you know, I wanted to find out more. So with Eva, and also we filmed a bunch of other people. I had this energy healer do a group healing um, with people from all walks of life who had different diseases that we didn't even know what they were. They just, we knew they wanted to show up for this energy healing session. And so there were times when, and one of them was a family member actually. And there's times when, uh, and you kind of hinted at this question before, like, people that don't necessarily resonate with the same things you do, how do you converse with them? What I had to learn is that, you know, because I want to, I genuinely want to help people, but you can't impose your beliefs on them, you know? So I just try to kind of not lean in and force, but just offer up kind of a tray of options and encourage them to explore what felt best for them. And then there's just a certain point where you just have to let people have their journey, even though you have an intuition about what might be at the root and you feel like they have a major blind spot or whatever. It's like, it's, you just have to allow people to have their journey and, and hold space with love and, you know, not impose your beliefs on them. Yeah. So speaking of um, diagnoses, you you were diagnosed with something during the I think it was the deck writing phase or maybe the beginning of your shooting. Can you talk about that experience and how that played a role in in your sensitivity uh, with the subjects going forward? 
Yeah. So a little before, yeah, in the preparation phase, um, when I was finally kind of ready to do the film, um, or maybe even like a year before that, I had gotten a new doctor for my husband because I, obviously I'd been researching all of these things and he was in a very conventional kind of concierge doctor um, cycle where they, you know, he had acid reflux, they'd give him a pill and it was just, he was taking more pills than I thought he needed to because he was very healthy, but he's just not educated. He's super busy and he's just going to trust his doctor. So as I started learning more and more, I said, you know, maybe we should find a more integrative doctor. Um, and so we, we got connected to this wonderful doctor who used to be a cardiologist and now is like this integrative um, internist. And we got him off, like we did all the blood tests and got him off, you know, some of the meds. And then we were just trying to do some new lifestyle interventions to eventually get him off all meds. And while he was doing his blood test, I was like, well, let's just test all my blood because maybe there's a food sensitivity and maybe there's some minor tweaks we can do and I can be a little bit more vital and optimal. And like a week later, we get the labs back and the doctor's like, I need you to come in and see me in my office. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And, and I go, is it about Alec? And he's like, no, no, it's about you. I'm like, oh, that's even more interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.